Okay, so we're being recorded. Uh, we have a raffle that we're doing to help with attendance. Um, so we have gift cards that we're giving away from Coffee Matters. So if you want to put your name um, and just your email so that we can put your name in to win a gift card from Coffee Matters. So we'll circulate this around. And anybody joining online, uh, you can just put your email in the chat and then um, Anot will select the winner for today. Uh, okay, so oops. Oh, just a uh, before we start, we do want to provide a land acknowledgement. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Nigma and the Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiabut and Nunatukabut and the Inu of Natasca and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province and we search for collective healing and true reconciliation in honor of this beautiful land together. Uh, so for our speakers today, starting out will be Rachel Ford. Uh, so Rachel is a first year master's student in the Center for Fisheries Ecosystems Research at MI, and she is currently studying Greenland shark uh, local abundance and life history traits using faded underwater video cameras under the supervision of Dr. John Fisher, she will be sharing with her some of the work. So, and then you can read the back. Oh. All right, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out today. It's nice to see a decent crowd. <laughs> um, so, thanks Eugenie, Eugenie for that uh, introduction. Um, as she mentioned, I am studying Greenland sharks, specifically their local abundance and natural mortality rate estimates. Eastern Canadian, Arctic, and Southern. I am part of Dr. Jonathan Fisher's lab in Super uh, Center. And this is my first year as a master's student here. So, a little bit about Greenland sharks, because I think that they are the coolest species on the planet. <laughs> and here's why. So, they are the longest living vertebrates, which is insane. They can live around 392 years, old, potentially even up to more than 500 years old. You put that in comparison, it's like one could be alive when Shakespeare was alive. That's pretty wild. Um, they are found all throughout the North Atlantic and Arctic Oceans, even including as far south as the Caribbean Sea. Most of the people assume that they're Arctic species, but they've been found off of Belize, uh, um, even all the way over to Portugal, so they actually have quite a, a large distribution. Um, they are deep sea fish. They like to live. Uh, in great depths. Uh, the maximum depth I've ever recorded for one was at 2,200 meters. Uh, but typically they're around. We saw that now. <laughs> About 10 minutes now. That's good. Um, yeah, so they prefer depths typically in the winter time, but actually in shallow areas on the surface, but in the summer, you can find them between 500 to 1,200 meters. But basically, they like people. Have a, a variety of uh, fish species, such as Cape Lynn char, halibut, also crustaceans, uh, even seals, and there's even been. Um, Reindeer and polar bear remains down those stumps of sharks. So they are, they think that they're ambush predators. It's hard to tell because they actually move quite slowly. Um, but how else would they get a seal in them? So then they thought that perhaps maybe they're just scavengers and that goes towards reindeer and polar bears. Obviously, they're not going up on land to eat those. <laughs> um, but it's assumed that they're uh, ambush predators and they also scavenge and anything they can find. They, as you can see in this individual here, it has this white dangly thing on the eye. Now they're quite famous for having these uh, parasites, these copepods, specifically Amatacoida hutchata species. And what these guys do is that they attach themselves permanently into the cornea of their eyes and just feed off of it. And this makes most of the sharks actually blind. But it's a good thing they have a good sense of smell. That's how they find the prey. They don't really rely. Um, they are also the largest fish in the Arctic, one of the largest shark species, reaching over 570 meters for their total length. And they also have a very slow metabolism. So, as I mentioned, they're really slow moving. 
a specifically cold water species. Um, and the maximum speed is only 0 0.74 meters per second. So that kind of goes back to thinking, are they really amber predators or just scavenging? Um, and they also grow extremely slow, uh, less than one centimeter per year. Yep. Now, because of all these qualities, taking a long time to reach uh, sexual maturity, probably around two to three years to reach sexual maturity. There's a lot of issues for conservation with them because they're such long living species. They're also very elusive and hard to study since they like the deep waters. And so we, we don't actually know much about them. They were listed as vulnerable species in IUCN 2019. And that's because the population has been declining between 11.7% to 72.9% over the past 450 years. That range is really big because we just don't have a lot of information about them. But um, yeah, we don't really know how much there are out there, but the population size are, even their distribution much. It's important that we study the species. And of course, there's not really, um, there's no particular fishery for these guys in Canada. Uh, it is in Iceland and some other areas, but here in Canada, the problem is that they're all often caught as bycatch in uh, crawl fisheries, longline, and gillnet fisheries in the Arctic, and specifically with the Greenland halibut fisheries. About 1,700 sharks are caught per year as bycatch just in the Canadian Arctic and subarctic alone. Worldwide, it's about 3,000. And as I mentioned, there's just not a lot of information about their abundance, population size, distribution, and even the basic biology like the natural mortality rates. So that's what I am focusing on for my master's. Uh, firstly, I am going to estimate local abundances of these sharks in the Eastern Canadian Arctic and subarctic using faded camera technology. I'll talk more about that later on. Um, and what I want to do is also study the distribution biomass, and size and sex structure of the population, like where are the males, where are the females, where are the adults, juveniles, and potentially find uh, nursery habitats. Um, and then for my second part of my thesis, I'm focusing on natural mortality rates and basing it on both length and age-based metrics. So onto the beta remote underwater video space, like I mentioned, this is what I'm using to study the sharks. Um, it's a great non-invasive method, which is ideal for studying vulnerable species and also hard to find species. Um, the frame is set up with a subsea camera, which is a company here in Newfoundland, uh, a bright white light, bait, which is used squid typically, and uh, a large battery and two reference lasers. So like and this is what they look like. And so we drop it down to the bottom of the ocean. It stays down there for about six to nine hours and we get about that much worth of HD video per deployment. So a lot of data. Um, and what we can do with these videos is uh, look at species diversity and event habitats. Uh, we can look at shark abundance, uh, individual characteristics such as their sex, uh, their length, and we can estimate their age based off of their length. Um, also scar patterns, and even their behavior, if there's multiple in one shot, we can look at their behavior with each other and also with other species. So there's a lot we can learn just from these uh, camera systems. Um, I'm going to be using data from 2015 all the way until now. Also, data that I'm going to collect next year. Uh, there's about 50 deployments that uh, I have to look over, so a lot of <laughs> looking at a computer. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have access to that data yet, uh, but I do have a few shots I would like to show you guys. And basically, these deployments have been taken all across uh, up and down Labrador Coast and the slope. Uh, off Newfoundland, like the Northeast Slope, and even into Bath and Bay, Arctic Archipelago. So there's a variety of sites, and hopefully there's actually one site to be one as well, but that has been taken at least three times, and we're going to be looking at doing that every year as we look at how it changes over time. The sharks have been seen there every time we put it here. And I was lucky enough to actually go on two boats this past year to collect the data myself. So I was on the Canadian Coast Guard ship with the Amazon, as well as Patrick and Bill and Bethel back in the summer and the fall. And hopefully I get to go on those again this upcoming year. So I, here's a little bullet. I was on the first leg from September 9th to 22nd, and we sampled all along Labrador's coast, went from Quick City to Iqaluit. 
and we managed to do four successful drug deployments. Unfortunately, no charts on any of those occasions. Um, but I also got to learn a lot while on the boat helping out with other projects, such as with fish and plankton net sampling with the genie here. And uh, yeah, it was just really exciting to be on the boat and learn so much from a variety of scientists from across the world, mostly Canadian, but also international scientists. And we got to see so much. Uh, we we're lucky enough to see nine polar bears, one up close about 50 meters away, <laughs> which was a little bit unnerving, <laughs> but very cool. Um, as well, lots of cool benthic invertebrates. We did one trawl, got hundreds and hundreds of ice pods, sides at the end. It was so interesting. Lots of fish species, and we even saw three fin whales on the way down. The bottom left photo there is a hydrobiot net, which is um, used to collect plankton at different uh, depths. And so there's nine nets open at different depths. We could get a sample of the whole water column that there. So I was involved with that and a variety of other now, my uh, experience on the Patrick William was a little bit different. The ship is much smaller, as you can see. Um, and it was later in the year, so we had a lot of problems with weather. Uh, it was supposed to be about a week and a half long. Fortunately, it was only a few days out at Funk Island Week, which was our location that we wanted to sample. Uh, and then we ended up doing more work inland in the Holy Word Conception Bay South area, just because the weather was so bad. We had formed the waves at one point and swells on top of that. <laughs> So it was a little bit rough and everyone was a bit seasick. <laughs> um, we got to do one grub deployment inland and I wasn't expecting to see any sharks there just within the bay, but uh, still good to get experience put out there and see what species are down inside uh, to set the base up. We also were involved in rosette deployments, we did eight or so, and as well as acoustic methods. So those are images down below. And then on the left there is a short beak common dolphin who saw a large pod of them, about 100, and we also saw about 40 white beak dolphins and potentially two possible North Atlantic right whales. And I say potential because it wasn't confirmed, um, but the Adam Templeton, he was our technician on the boat with us, and he took a course, he was pretty confident that's what we saw. So we were very excited. And I'm just telling everybody I saw them. So it's, like, <laughs> it's pretty exciting because they're an endangered species and there's less than 400 of them left in the world. So. We are very excited for that. Um, now, a little bit about the cameras, what we see in, in the videos. So, um, we can see a variety of different fish species and that big organisms, such as in the top left here, you have granite deer, and then one who ate from that. You see Greenland halibut, Atlantic cod, skeleton species, uh, lots of snow crabs, and of course, Greenland sharks. So, I'm so I'm going to show you a little video that was taken off of the North Coast slope back in August. And this is about 1,400 meters deep. See, or, um, just imagine the Jaws deeps. Pretty impressive, eh? That was an adult female, probably around 450 centimeters long. Yeah, you can see, I think she had a pod in her thigh. And you can see the lasers there. Those, we use those to measure the shark and also look at their swimming speed. And the way I can tell it's a female is because she doesn't have any claspers for the back there. If there's claspers, then it's a shark, not a female. Sometimes it's hard to see. And this is an ideal situation where the shark is swimming right in front of the camera, pair, or parallel with it, perpendicular. So I can actually get the lens. A lot of times they don't do that, you know, just have the head coming through. It's very difficult, but this is the ideal situation. So, um, going back to my thesis questions, basically what I'm doing with these videos is getting the relative abundance of the sharks in different locations. And I can calculate that from the average times of the first arrival on the video, the swimming speeds, as well as the local current velocity estimates. So I put it in this equation to get the local uh, abundance estimates for that site. 
Um, I can also get their age estimated from their length, which is the basis, as I said, and that can help me figure out their biomass of the sites as well. And so this is an example of a plot taken from Green Divine, who was PhD student a few years ago, who did similar work to this, and I'm building on their project. So you can see on the y-axis on the left is theoretical shark density for common squared, the theoretical shark biomass for every single site. And what I also want to do is compare uh, size and site structure between these sites. So I'm just looking at their general biogeography questions, where the sharks are and what they can possibly do. And then the second part of my thesis is both focusing on natural mortality rates, which would be uh, estimated by comparing shark size to trait data, their size at Maturity and agent length estimates, and then comparing it to other Alaska brain species, so other shark species. Um, and it's generally expected that human sharks have an extremely low uh, natural mortality rate because they live for so long. So, in these graphs on the right, I'm taking from the real paper and in. And so, the natural mortality both on the y axis, along the x max and h at the top, and then length at maturity. In both cases, that mortality goes down um, with a max a little bit greater age. Right? So with human sharks living potentially up to 500 years, assume they have a very low uh, mortality rate. But with these, with that low natural mortality rate, and, and it has implications for the magnitude of fishery related uh, mortality for the population that can sustain, sustain uh, fisheries. So it's important we learn more about that so we try to protect them and include them in the conservation works with expanding Arctic fisheries. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Fisher and Dave Cote, who have supervised me so far, uh, as well as I was funded by NSERC and the Online School of Graduate Studies, as well as everybody involved this past year that's helped me collect the broad data. Which is Jordan, Sheena, Jessica, G, Jenny, Adam, as well as many others. I'd also like to thank everyone that was on the boat with you, for the answer and having to learn super stuff for helping organize expeditions. And thank you for listening. Oh, yeah. Yeah, open to questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay. So it's we've been sort of divided between the effects that are up there. So they're red, but it's not the effects that are going to be up. But then that's all on the Arctic, like the sample of a study in Norway, I think 84% so of the population size had the response. I don't know if there's so much study on that there. But then we assume that just. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, if anyone has a quick question in the chat or on the online, they can, or Anot can read the question in the chat. Um, that's what we did average. I've only seen a few of the videos so far. And all the yeah, the next one is here except for a half. But <laughs> yeah, they're very, just very slow. <laughs> The 
question, the question was, why do they dig around in the sediment and not actually incubate? Yeah, like, come on, it's good right there. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know why they do that. Like, I know they eat bent of organs, but like a big stand. Like, I think the biggest question, but maybe they're trying to sense movement. But they do, they do eat squid, actually. I think it could be, um, okay, so sharks have these little cord, they call it like belly fill, and they can sense electro, like, pulp. And really try to too. So they definitely rely on that sequence. Um, and perhaps because it's great sound, we can move it Um, okay, so next, we're just downloading, um, not this next one, but the one after the presentation. Um, so we're going to welcome Genevieve Peck. Um, she is a first year fisheries science and technology master's student um, in the Center for Sustainable Aquatic Resources studying whale safe, sorry, <laughs> whale safe gear for the snow crab fishery in Ontario. Uh, wait, in Newfoundland and Labrador. <laughs> sorry. She received a bachelor uh, from science at the Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, where she discovered her passion for conservation and aquatic ecosystems, leading her to pursue a research career in marine biology. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Thank you for the introduction. So, my name is Jen Peck, and I am a master's student um, at the uh, Um, and today I'm going to present a little bit about my research, which is evaluating viability of whale seed for Not at all. Not much of that. <laughs> so a little background on uh, why we're doing this. As uh, some of you may know, our right whales are And uh, at the last estimate, their population was around 300. Only under 70 of them are held. Uh, so they have been part of a, an unusual mortality event in our current 2017. And that event uh, documented death series and with our WHO. Um, out, as of now, 94 whales have been documented in the representative And um, from that number, 35 are documented deaths, uh, 11 from vessel strike, and 19 from with 13 of the causes. However, only a third of right whales that are uh, documented, therefore, this is thought to be a uh, But bottom line, more than percent of right whales are dying at a faster rate than we So, why are entanglements such a big concern? Um, well, 83% of the northern right whale population so, show scars from entanglement, and 59% have scars from more than one. Have scars from up to nine. And the issue with entanglement is that if they don't uh, directly result in mortality, they contribute to reduce fitness for size at age and historically low count rate, therefore, further impeding the population. So, 
these are uh, the reported North Lands of right whale injuries uh, due to entanglement so far. This is just this past month or so. Uh, the first of which in January 12, uh, a juvenile reported to have by illegal injuries, it used to oil. Um, next on January 26, a male called Nimbus was observed to have a rope around his snout for the there. Um, part of the rope has been uh, and we introduced or categorized as sub legal as of now. Um, however, if the rope that remains, um, if the rope remains, it can change. They hope that you can shed it. Um, uncertain at the moment. Um, and finally, this is one on January 27th. Uh, a male was observed uh, dragging two lobster traps. Uh, traps. These traps have now been uh, um, effort. Um, however, uh, they're still not sure, sure if our will will be whether it's legal or something. So, in order to mitigate or avoid um, entanglement, uh, there exists whale safety gear, and there are two types of whale safety gear. The first is low breaking strength ropes or links, as you can see uh, at the bottom here. Uh, so there's the links and ropes, and those are inserted, inserted in down lines, and they are designed to break at uh, 1,700 pounds per second to reduce the risk of injuries to whales that become entangled. And then the second type of whale safety gear is which uh, completely eliminates the rope water quality. Uh, however, I won't expand on that because I'm focusing my research on low breaking fish. And the reason why is because fishery in Ocean Canada is implementing the required use of low breaking fish in here in non tended and secure commercial by next year. So the implementation of low breaking strength ropes would likely reduce the probability of mortality of suffering, sorry, of mortality and suffering by 87% whales. However, this is assuming that such ropes could be practiced. So we don't know that yet, and they have never been tested in Labrador, um, especially in the South So my research objective is to first answer the question, can these gear modifications Typical hauling conditions in the snow crab fishery without leading to more long draft of rope. And I hope to do this by measuring tension on down ropes during hauling to determine if and when this 17 foot And second, I want to perform industry trials of your modification with scientific in order to determine the suitability. So I want to identify parameters affecting the efficacy of different features. So uh, the first experiment uh, for my research was done this fall, where we measured tension on ropes while hauling in an inshore experiment. And uh, we measured the tension using this device called a load cell, which is attached over the hauler. Um, and this load cell takes measurement twice every second um, on the force experienced by the rope or the tension. Um, and so we installed this on the hauler and we performed a ton of uh, hauls. So we were setting traps and hauling them and measuring the tension that was experienced to replicate um, We were using three traps, three, three types of traps uh, during this experiment. The first one was wire traps, which are just the traditional conical traps, but without the mesh. Second one are traditional traps, but unbaited, so just the trap by themselves. And finally, we had traditional Absolutely baited them, left them for 24 hours, allowing them to fish, and then pick them back up the next day and measure the tension. And this was done in order to replicate the food process. Um, we performed this experiment inshore, as I mentioned, so in Conception Bay land. So this uh, red rectangle here, and if we zoom in, you can see this little red cluster is all the sites uh, where we hauled. Um, all these sites were in about 150 to 160 fathoms of water. Um, and we were fishing our hauling uh, fleet of 50 traps. So it was uh, a whole rope with 50 traps attached, uh, two, down, two down ropes, two buoys, um, and 18 fathoms in between traps. 
So if we were doing uh, wire treatment, all of them are wire undated, all of them are undated. Of the traps. Um, in total, we did 63 of the calls. And if you look at the results, we had 24 calls uh, with the wire traps, and none of these calls exceeded the 17 pounds of force uh, during calling. Uh, for the unbated, we had 22, and two of them exceeded the 17 empty caps and two of them still um, exceeded that maximum. Um, and then for the betas, those 17 calls that we perform, all of them exceeded the 17 force, reaching a force as high as 2,654 force. Um, so as you can see, by the uh, difference that we can observe between wire and unbated, uh, we assume that this might be because of the mesh that's around it creating a drag of the water. So with these results and when using load cells, we can uh, take the numbers and create these plots, these tension curves, plotting the tension against the time. Uh, this is an example of one of the hauls we did. It was a baited haul on a day with a uh, wind speed of 15 knots and a wave height of basically nothing, one feet. So the speed of haul and conditions were near ideal. Um, and still we can observe multiple peaks above that 70. So when we say that a call exceeded 17 pounds, we don't just mean it came up for just one single week. You can actually see that it's exceeding that threshold um, almost throughout the whole call. Um, and these high peaks are observed as the traps are breaking the surface of the water. That's when uh, they're at their heaviest. Um, however, you can see that in the first few minutes, the attention is not yet exceeding this um, 17. Um, and that's because it's only following the first down. Therefore, we like to think that if we could put the weak gear on the down row before all that tension is on the line, they could still be viable with our fishery. So if these hauls exceed 17 first pounds, it doesn't mean that this gear is not good That's where they are. So we have a few upcoming experiments. Uh, this spring, we will collect attention data using low cells, just as we did, but we're gonna do it offshore this time uh, during snow prep machine. So the goal is to quantify your haul attention offshore and compare it with what you've already um, collected inshore. And then um, this summer or fall, um, we'd like to perform, sorry, gear trials, uh, sorry, trials of gear modifications in simulated fishing conditions, so using data that. And the goal of that would be to generate data on the frequency of the gear while hauling and what factors are affected. So, for example, where the gear is placed on the line, um, while still while still being useful for mitigating um, serious injury to the value of right whale, um, could it be placed somewhere where it breaks during haul? So, implementing the gear by 2024 can reduce the right whale injury and fatality. However, we need to determine if the gear can be safely implemented to decrease gear loss, forming um, another big threat for the whale. Therefore, research before adoption is crucial to reduce further environmental impact. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Paul Wainer, my supervisor, um, a few technicians at CSR who helped with representing uh, the experiments for this project, Lindsay, Megan, Craig, and George. Um, as well as Alex Day and all the crew aboard the Island Voyager uh, that was the charter, Dr. Ed Trimble, CFO, and the Whale Safety Research Doctor from from the other project. Um, I see questions, but if you don't have any ask, feel free to email in the chat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the reason that CFO is um, implementing this stuff is because of the North Atlantic right whale crisis. I'm not saying it doesn't affect other whales, it does, um, especially humpbacks. But um, 
please gear implementation implementation with them because of the pressure from this critically endangered species. Um, as to where they are in the water column, so um, they prefer um, shallower depths and they don't go that deep. So usually, or what their GFO is probably suggesting is about a third of the way down um, in on the rope, which is actually like not that deep down. So there is good potential that we'll be able to call that before high tension is um, on this deep gear. However, it also depends in what depth of water you're fishing, like a lot, a lot of um, factors affect that. But Well, it depends where, like in those big piles. Of um, so actually, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but uh, it also depends on where the And so that also. Yes. Yes, yes. So yeah, by, by all of these chats are all on. Um, okay, so our next speaker uh, is Grace Walls. So Grace Walls is a third year um, doctoral candidate in the St. Francis Xavier University and Memorial University's joint program studying foraging behavior of lobsters using video cameras. She completed her bachelor's of science in biology with a minors in natural resource conservation and psychology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and her master's in biological oceanography at GEOMAR. Uh, her master's thesis focused on the effects of changing environmental conditions on plastic ingestion and feeding ecology of a benthopelagic fish. That's very cool. I didn't know that. Huh. Um, okay, so. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Grace Walls, and I am the doctoral candidate in the McGaw lab here. I did the substitute. You're great. Good catch. I put this on presenters. Do you will it share presenters here? Uh, yep. Good thing I just did this two weeks ago. <laughs> um, so my name is Grace Walls. I am the doctoral candidate in the McGaw lab here at the Ocean Science Center, and I'm part of a joint program between MUN and Fan Effects. So within Fan Effects, I'm under Russell Wyeth, and together we're looking at the foraging responses of American lobster or Homeris americanus. We do, you do this using baited underwater video tripods, kind of the theme of the evening. Um, and we have custom designed these steel tripods to be able to deploy relatively easily off of lobster vessels both during their season and afterwards. 
so this is our view from the camera. It is just a GoPro Hero 4, and it allows us to collect very, very minute details and behaviors of lobsters interacting. You can see antenna flicks. We have a scale in there with marks every three centimeters to be able to get the lobster's relative sizes, as well as any other species that come by. We've had seals, a lot of cod recently. It's been very interesting. And also get a very good view of the substrate as fishermen are very determined that where they place their traps and what that substrate is matters drastically to their catch. From here, we quantify the videos using field of view counts. So here we had nine lobsters, at least partially within the field of view. And these counts are taken at certain intervals throughout every trial to get an average of the field of view at all time across trials. We deploy five tripods um, from each vessel, and that averages out to around 360 hours of video data per set. So each tripod is deployed. We have 15 that we deploy four days a week. So we end up with around nine, uh, around 12 replicates, which will accept up to three losses. So we end up with a, a minimum of nine replicates of each bait for our experiments. So we start and end each season with a standard set of baits that allows us to compare how lobsters interact with the same baits across larger gaps in time, be it months within one field season or years between seasons. So our standard baits, you can see along our x-axis as a control, which is an empty bait bag and just how the lobsters interact with our camera system. We then have commercial baits, which are pairing mackerel and uh, natural fodder of blue mussels, and then another commercial standard of rock crab. And as you can see, the, a lot of error bars are overlapping, so there's really no significant difference in the number of lobsters in the field of view across these three commercial species. However, they do differ significantly from mussels, which is their natural fodder, and everything differs from just the empty bait bag and how many lobsters approach and spend time around the cameras. So we repeated this at the start and end of each of our field seasons. So this is a similar plot with the bait on our X and the average number of lobsters in the field of view on our Y. The colors coordinate to which set or experiment so the light yellow is the graph I just showed you previously. And you can see that even though there are slight differences in how many lobsters are averaging around each of these baits at different times of year, different years, they still are not significantly different from within the baits. And they do all follow the same trend. So in years where or months where we had a lot of lobsters present, those when we model later will most likely be pulled back down due to which harbor we were in or what substrate we were on and other factors that affect the number of lobsters in the area. So since there is no significant changes within each species, instead of only being able to compare within an experiment, whatever four or five species we tested, this actually was really helpful for us because it allows us to test across our entire staircase and they're derpy and I love them so much. And they're, they're, they're derpy dicks. They're just so mean to each other and so wonderful as a species. Um, so this allows us to compare our baits regardless of when we tested them and was also very confirming in that we believed our tripods work the same as traps. And we know in traps, natural fodder does not work as well as these commercial baits. So it confirmed for both us and the fishermen, which is really helpful, that the results we see are what we expect to work for their traps as well. So this leads me to my staircase. We tested 40 different baits. And as you can tell, some of them did a lot better than others. On our lower end, we have a lot of natural baits, so that starts with the macroalgae, our control, tunicates, periwinkles, pig skin, which is really fun to expense, uh, sea urchin, sea stars, beef suet, mussels, chicken blood, snow crab carapaces from the snow crab industry, 
chicken organs, clam, which was a new uh, exciting bait to use in the, the harbors that we were at of uh, the fishermen, bloodworms, bait masters, which is a uh, sustainable compound bait that's coming on the market, redfish, a variation of sioux bait, which is another uh, sustainable compound bait, rock crabs, an additional sioux bait variant, chicken heads, flounder, mackerel, herring, two sioux baits, shrimp heads from the shrimp industry, and then five other sioux bait variants. So as you can see, the baits that are side by side don't really, aren't really um, significantly different from each other, but definitely the top and the bottom of our staircase show that there are very different reactions of lobsters to these different baits that we put down. And what we expected, we did see with most of the terrestrial byproducts that we tested as alternative sustainable options, as well as the majority of their natural baits are all at the bottom in our lowest um, average number of lobsters within the field of view. So as it is very difficult to tease out the, um, the staircase, we broke it into three general categories, just kind of drawing the lines in the sand to break it apart. So we categorized these baits as low, medium, and high, or no better than natural, or middle ground, or herring mackerel are better. So again, low, all of those natural baits, and most of our um, terrestrial byproduct options, the middle ground, which were four of the commercially used baits, uh, bloodworms, which is a natural fodder, and then three of the byproduct options, and two of the alternative sustainable compound baits that can be used by fishermen and bought specifically instead of their traditional commercial baits. Finally, herring, mackerel, or better includes, of course, herring and mackerel, shrimp heads, and several of our sea bait variations that we tested, which is very exciting to see. So there is, of course, a few caveats with the research. Uh, using tripods and video footage instead of traps, which we proved already that, oh God, the computer's about to die. I don't know who can deal with that. <laughs> but that'll be a problem. Um, so using uh, the tripods and video footage instead of traps, we showed that they do show the exact same that we expect, where if you put natural fodder in under the tripod or in a trap, it has a much lower lobster attendance than if you put some of their commercial baits. There. Oh, we made it. Excellent. Cool. Um, there was some variability in our replication, which was due to the wonderful weather of the, the, the Northampton Straits. And we had to work with our fishermen, and some of them are only available on certain days. So depending on which fishermen were available, we had to bounce between different harbors, which dealt with then different populations of lobsters. And finally, bait suitability to soaking overnight, because all of the fishermen that we work with do, in fact, soak all their baits at least overnight and then over the weekend. And we time out once the cameras clock off. There, we can't say anything that happens after that nine hour mark, which is about as long as our videos can go. And if we were doing a day versus night trial, then we're limited by how long the torches were lit. And that gets us around five hours for trial. So a quick summary of the field work we've done so far. We did seven experiments in 2020, another eight in 2021, and then six last year before funding decided we can't go on boats anymore. So overall, we have just under 6,000 hours of footage to go through, which is roughly eight months of 24 seven footage. And that's why everything's been a subset so far. So going forward, there are other things I want to look at aside from just the quantification of the field of view counts and looking at how many individuals are in physical contact with the bait bag. We're going to look at the locations. So these are four of the five harbors that we sampled from. <clears throat> the substrate, which we've classified as either seaweed, rock, gravel, sand, 
or silt. And by pulling out if these substrates affect the number of lobsters that we're seeing or what sizes or sexes of the lobsters that are visible, we can get a better idea of what populations are where. The time of year, because the Northumberland Strait does change drastically over the course of lobster season and the rest of the summer, including where their molt cycle is. And finally, the time of day, as everyone knows, lobsters are absolutely nocturnal. And I've, one of the first papers we're hoping to publish is proving that they are, in fact. And then there are all the biotic factors that will be affecting the foraging responses, including their size and their sex, as we did a side project that allowed us to prove that you can infect sex lobsters from above using our video footage, which was very exciting. And finally, looking at the effects of the fishermen and what they have trained the lobsters to be interested in. We did this but first by looking piecewise at the same bait we did gastro, also known as alewife, and we tested a whole bait, just the heads, just the fillets, or the racks to see if byproducts worked as well as something that can be consumed commercially by people or used for something else. And then we took it a step further and looked at the preparation, so whole racks and cut redfish which was then either fresh, frozen, or aged. It was supposed to be aged for a week, but then we ran into weather problems and had to age fish for two weeks at room temperature. It was quite an experience for biology student undergrads. Um, and finally, we are looking at behavioral indices of interest. So we have 6,000 hours of lobsters running around and we can figure out so many different behaviors and interactions. So we currently have three teams of bachelor students answering a bunch of questions um, in regards to behavior, which is very exciting. So looking forward for the fishery, even as our common commercial traditional baits are disappearing, we hope to show that there are alternatives. There are byproducts from other industries that can be used instead of being composted. There are byproducts from terrestrial industries that can in fact work. And there are multiple companies that are setting forth all these different sustainable alternatives that are coming onto the market now. And even more that are starting up and just looking for someone to test and prove that their baits work. So it's not utterly devastating that herring and mackerel are gone for the lobster fishermen this year. And with that, I'd like to give some acknowledgments to all of the fishermen organizations, the Atlantic Fisheries Fund, North Bay Fishermen's Co-op, uh, North um, Nova Scotia Bonafide, and the Maritime Fishermen's Uni Union, and our two teams of bachelor students that helped out during our field seasons. And with that, if anyone has any questions, I'll have them take them. It is the main goal of both Baitmaster and Subate is to be creating baits that are right at the same level cost wise, if not cheaper, uh, without using um, forage fish. And if they do use forage fish, it is byproduct from human consumption or other industries. Yes. Those were launched off my tripods as a parasitic project. <laughs> um, and from what we saw, there was no difference whatsoever between the control and the acoustic base. But there are multiple acoustic options out there. So we were partnering with Dow and Ocean Sonic to design a new hydrophone um, setup that had a speaker attachment. So the first year we collected lobster sounds, analyzed them. They make squeaks and clicks and whistles. It's adorable. 
And then the next year we selected some and played them back to no effect. Um, but I know there are other, like there's a little red speaker that is available. That one we did not test. That one was another company's. Um, but I, I, I don't know how that one. Yeah. Um. So it depends on the bait. The top one is entirely artificial. They tried to distill what exactly is the scent, is the chemical that attracts lobsters to these decomposing fish. Bait masters and sous bait is using byproducts and other fillers and things to create bait that lasts, that you can, especially bait master, that you can redeploy several times and will last through those deployments. And that doesn't use direct forage fish that was harvested exclusively for bait. Um, and then the soldier fly larva is coming online. They approached us a week after I pulled out of the water. It was really frustrating. Um, that is using organic compost to raise soldier fly larva. It's currently used for dog foods and salmon feed, and they're testing it now to be a lobster bait because it's a protein. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so that concludes our seminar series of the day. Um, so thank you to our speakers and everyone who joined us uh, online and also at Hampton Hall. Um, due to the winter break, our next seminar will be on Tuesday, February 28th at 2.30, where we will hear from Mike McAllister about his work researching sharks and rays in Florida. Um, and then I think that the last thing is that there was the raffle sheet. Okay, you can just leave it on the, the banister there and we'll get it on the way out. Yeah, and then we will select the winner and then email you if you want. And you'll get your $2,000 gift card. I just <laughs> That was in budget. Okay, thanks everybody.